Hello, everybody. How are you? I wonder if the system works. That's what we always need to find out whenever we start and ask math anything. And the reason is because this is a new show. If, you, if this is the first time that you're here, let me explain to you how this thing works. First of all, the way that you can talk on this show is by going to live.poshendo.com slash show as linked inside, uh, inside the YouTube description. By the way, can you hear me? That's the easiest way for me to find out whether the system works is if people can type into that whether or not you can see me, whether or not you can hear me. Oh, now I'm trying to figure out if something is not working. Just a second. One moment, please. I'm just, oh, oh, you can hear, you can hear. Oh, good, good, good. So there are people here. I just wanted to make sure that this thing was working. Very good. Okay, well, in that case, let me go ahead and explain how this thing works. So I'm Po Shen Lo. Uh, I'm a mathematician. I usually run around the whole world and the whole country talking about math. But today we have something much better. In fact, it's because I've had the great pleasure of working with incredible high school students uh, over the course of the last few months on what we make at the Daily Challenge. And so today we're really happy to be running the Ask Math Anything with two incredible co-hosts who are both from Washington State. They actually both did math counts too. Actually, they both qualified. They were both among the top four in their state when they were doing math counts, Alon and Eric. But now, uh, in order to explain how this system, how, how the thing works, how the show works, what happens is that anyone can ask any questions about math. And what they will do, because they happen to know a lot of math, is that they will be choosing the questions that they think would be the most interesting to answer among, for, uh, for people who might be learning algebra or geometry. So yes, uh, it is indeed pretty impressive what they have. They, have. they have a lot of mathematical background. Of course, they'll introduce each other too in a moment. But the way that this works is please go ahead and ask your questions into the chat. And what you'll see is that you'll see them cooking up lessons for you on the spot. It's really quite impressive. Well, with that said, let's go ahead and jump right in. So I'm going to pass this over to Alon and Eric. Why don't you two introduce each other and then you can go ahead. Right then. All right, let's get started. So my, um, I have, I'm very happy to be working with um, Alon here. So he is also like Professor Loki said, he is from Washington State with me, which is the only state where someone asks you where you're from. You have to say no, the other one. Um, he has qualified for the AME three times. Um, he is actually gone to math counts nationals uh, and plays top 56. And he also plays a snare drum, which I'm not sure is much different from just drums, but that's what he told me to say. Alon? Yeah, thank you so much, Eric. So I'm here with the amazing Eric. Um, he is also from Washington, which is by far the best state as everyone here knows. Um, he is a USA JMO winner, a five times in qualifier, and he was a Math Counts Nationals qualifier, although sadly it was during the year that it didn't happen, but he still qualified for it, which is really good. And he told me to say that he swims, so. <laughs> yeah. I needed to include something in there. All right, so let's get started, I guess. Um, okay. I see here, there's a pretty cool problem um wait what does it say oh uh, okay wait, is, is okay okay i think i think we'll take this problem so the problem here says um the zeros of the function f of x equals x squared minus ax plus 2a are integers so it has integer solutions okay and then it's asking us, what is the sum of the possible values of A? Okay, so this is integer solution. So essentially, we can factor this out into X minus, um, I don't know, let's say X minus P times X minus Q, where P and Q are integers. So we know here that P plus Q equals A. You can expand it or you can use Vietas, up to you. And we also know that PQ equals two times A. Okay, and we wanna find the possible values of A. All right, interesting. Well, the first thing I wanna do here is I want to um, solve for, for X, the possible values of X, which are P and Q. So we can use the quadratic equation here. And that is um, negative B plus or minus square root of B squared minus four C over two A, a pretty big mouthful. But here we can apply it. So it's a plus or minus the square root of a squared minus 8a over 2. Okay. And this is going to be equal to p plus 
the uh, P and Q essentially, where you have the plus or minus here. And it has to also be integers. Interesting. This is this is kind of hard actually, you know? So mm -hmm. instead of doing this, what if we tried solving for P and Q and seeing what we get from there? So we're gonna let here um, P equals A minus Q, and then we're gonna put this into there to see if we get anything cool. So I feel like you would get the quadratic equation back, right? Is that? Yeah, but then you can, th this is like a nicer form though, because oh, then you can like true. apply. Yeah, so then you can like, because you can use that they're integers, so it's much nicer in general. So you get A minus Q times Q equals two A. Oh, this is kind of weird. Well, okay, okay. We know here that like, um, so what are the possible values of these? We know that like P and Q could be like two and A for instance, right? Because two and A multiply up to two A, but that can't work because two plus A is not A, obviously. Okay. So what if it was like three and something for instance? I don't know, let, let, let's try that. So if it was three and two A over three. So in that case, we would obtain that it would be three plus two A plus three equals A. So that um, three equals A over three and A equals nine. Does that work? Maybe. X squared minus nine X plus 18. And yep, this has X minus three and X minus six as, a fa as factors. Okay, okay. But three is obviously not the only possibility in this case. We could have, I don't know, one of them being four, and then the other one would end up being A over two. So four and A over two. Okay, and that is four plus A over two is equal to A. So four equals A over two, and A equals eight. And for this one, it would be X squared minus eight X plus 16. And that becomes X minus eight, no, X minus four times X minus four. So that gives us another solution. Okay, what if we want five? What if we had five and two A over five? In this case, we get five plus two A over five equals A. So five equals three A over five and oh, that does not work because we have a factor of three here and a factor of five here. So A would be a fraction and that can't be. Well, right. Okay. They never said A can't be a fraction in the problem. Oh, wait, uh, hold on. Wait, really? Wait, wait. Because because here's the thing. When I was thinking about this problem, right, I was like, wait, because if you take this discriminant here, root A squared minus 8A, A doesn't have to necessarily be like a uh, an integer. It doesn't even have to be a fraction, right? So what if like there's some magical, miraculous way that pairs this some, I don't, I don't know. Um, but like sure? you said, A could okay. be... At least the way the problem was worded. I, I, I swear, I've seen this problem before. I'm going to fact check this for you. Uh, you can keep going, but. <laughs> okay, but just for the sake of curiosity, what if we do let A be on the integer? In that case, um, we would have like P and 2A over P in general, where like this would be Q. And so that gives us P plus 2A over P is equal to um, A, which becomes P equals a times one minus two over p. And so a would be p over one minus two over p. And therefore, if Eric is right and um a could a doesn't have to be an integer, then we would actually have a for any integer p. So I think this works for a lot of numbers. But mm -hmm. if it's not, then if it's not, then we actually have some restrictions here. If it's this not this is this this was an AMC problem. And I'm currently on Math Stack Exchange, um, and <laughs> okay, all the solutions okay. for. <laughs> don't ask. So uh, this is equal to this, and this is a. And so, in that case, I'm assuming that a has to be an integer, but, um, um, because if a is an integer, then in that case we just have that like, it has this this has to be true. And in this case, um, I think that there's just like a maximum, like like in, in, in this case, right? Um, if you go past, I think if you go past four, it just stops working at all. And therefore these would be our only two solutions. But if it's not, then I think anything works. 
right? So, okay, let, let's just assume that A has to be an integer, in which case these two would be our only solution. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, I see. Uh, someone in the chat uh, said A must be an integer by Vieta's formula. Thank you. That's, that's a really good point. Because the sum of the roots has to be um, A, I think, if I remember the question. So A must be an integer as well. So there we go. Crisis averted. <laughs> Um, right, yeah, so then you can just continue with a long solution and just. Yeah, okay, so I think we finished with that problem. Let's go find another problem now. Um... Uh, yeah, okay, so hopefully I don't get something that pain, that hard, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see what you guys have put in here. Um, I will say that there is a person in chat impersonating me, and that is not me. So, <laughs> um, ooh, we got a couple interesting ones. Cool. Um, right, right. Then let, let's let's do that. Let's do this one. So they want us to find what is two minus one half minus one fourth minus one eighth minus one sixteenth on and on and on until infinity. Um, so. What the, what is that problem that just showed up under my face? <laughs> um, anyways, uh, so we're asked to evaluate this series up here, and I realized that we've just done two algebra problems in a row, and I might have made a mistake, but it's fine. Uh, we're going to get through it. So it's actually the hard part of the problem is doing everything from this subtraction sign onwards. Um, this two, we don't really need to worry about. So really, if we can find what this is, then we should be Good. No, we're not doing the hunter and invisible rat, rabbit problem. Don't even try. Um, one half to one. Si so this is an infinite series. And if you were trying to calculate, calculate this out by hand, it will take an infinite amount of time, which sadly we only have an hour. Um, so that's not going to work. Instead, we have to use a bit of cleverness. So I'm going to label this sum to be S. I'm going to say, well, you know, there's an infinite number of terms. I just wish we could get rid of this infinite number of terms. So what I'm gonna do, so I'm gonna say, well, I have this one half here, and I'm just gonna segregate it from the rest of the terms. Just leave it on its own out in the rain. Cool. So now in this parentheses, what do I have? Well, one fourth is one half of one half. One eighth is one half of one fourth. One sixteenth is one half of one eighth, and so on and so forth. So what I have in the parentheses is actually one half of s. Um, you can think of it coloring it a square. First color half the square. Of the, yeah, that that's one way to do. It. I'll go over, I'll go over that in a second. But anyways, um, you might be thinking, well, Eric, you got rid of a term, right? So there's less terms in here than there are up here. Wrong, because there's an infinite number of terms in the sequence. There are still an infinite number of terms in this sequence. Um, basically, it's going to keep going on and on, keep canceling each other out until infinity. And in the end, um, you have the same number of terms. It's infinity is weird. It just works like that. Uh, that's the only way I could talk about it, explain it. But one half plus one half s, that has to equal s, and therefore, we can solve for s then. So that means we have one half s equals one half s equal one. My sum <coughs> here is one. And since we're looking for two minus s, which is two minus the sum, we get two minus one is equal to one. Now, someone in chat also did mention um, a geometric way of looking at this, which I also really like. So if I have a square here that represents one, well, I could start with one half. So I'm going to color in half the square. Then I have a quarter, color in a quarter, then an eighth, then a the sixteenth, then a the thirty-second, a sixty-fourth, one twenty, one twenty-six, and then you can't see anything anymore, but it goes on to infinity. And you can see once I finished coloring, um, after an eternity, um, I will have filled up the entire square. So the sum is also one, like that. Do you have anything else to say about this one? No, I think that was a great solution. Yeah. And uh, for our next problem, I saw uh, way earlier that there was this really cool problem up here. So 
five different awards are to be given to three students. Each student will receive at least one award. In how many way, different ways can the awards be distributed? So I think the best way to go about this problem is actually just a little bit of case work. So what we're going to do here is we have, um, so we have student one, two, and three. And we're going to do cases on how many awards each student gets. So the first case is where one student gets three awards, another one gets one award, and another one gets one award. And the other case is where uh, one student gets two awards, one student gets two awards, and the other one gets one award. And there are actually no other cases because every student needs to get at least one award. So these are the only cases we have actually. But now here's the problem. Each case has multiple subcases sort of because person one could be getting three awards or two or three. So that's a bit of a problem, right? Not really actually, because we have a lot of symmetry here. So what we can say is that there are three ways to pick which student gets the third award, the, the three awards. And then after that, we distribute the rest of the awards. So after we chose which student gets the three awards, we now choose which awards they receive. And for that, there are in fact five choose three ways to do it because we're just picking three awards. And now finally, we just have two ways to decide which of these awards goes to which person. So it'd be this times two. Awesome. And this can be evaluated to be three times 10 times two, which is six. Okay. For this case, it's actually very similar because first of all, we have three ways to choose which person gets one award. So that'd be three. And then after that, we just got to pick which awards each person gets. So there's five choose two ways for this one because we're choosing two awards. And then another three choose two ways for this one because we're choosing two awards from three awards left. And so now this gives us three times 10 times three, which is 90. And overall that would be 60 plus 90, which is 150. Wow, that is a lot of ways to do this. Okay, and I see someone in the chat asked if you can use stars and bars. That is a great question. And I think the answer is no, because the problem is that the items you're distributing are in fact distinct. So um, let's say we had like our items, let's say we had our awards numbered one, two, three, four, five. So what we would do first is we would first arrange these in any way. So we'd have like 120, uh, 120 ways because it's five factorial. And then we would do stars and bars by having, you know, uh, you have five stars and two bars and you arrange those. But see, the problem is now that if we have say one, two, three, bar four, bar five or something like this, this is actually equivalent to two, one, three, bar five, bar four, bar five. And the reason for that is because the first person is still getting the same number of awards regardless. So you would have to do some kind of um, like accounting for overcount. You have to like subtract off some cases regardless um, in order to get down to the real number because these cases are overcount. And that would just be too painful. So it's much easier to just do some, just a little bit of casework to figure out what the answer is, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, but I agree. Um, casework might be the best way. Though I do have an alternative way to do this with um... Complementary counting. I forgot the term for a second. Um, it's a little, it's a little more complex, and I don't really recommend it because I think Alon's way is much uh, better. But um, yeah, you you could find the total number of ways and the subtractive ways where someone doesn't get any awards. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not that big a deal. Anyways, um, I might be shooting myself in the foot by picking this next question, but we'll see what happens. Um, an unbiased coin. <clears throat> is tossed an unbiased coin is tossed in times find a formula in closed form for the expected value of um, absolute value h minus t where h is the number of heads and t is the number of tails um wow so this looks like a pretty rough question for us so unbiased coin again means that the odds are 50 50 so let's just well let's see what happens um, I'm going to have n of these rolls, um, and what's going to happen is I'm just, you start by listing um, how many ways, what's the probability of getting each number of heads? So let's, let's instead of n, let's go for a simpler example. Like, let's say I have four 
coin tosses. Because I'm just going to start messing around with this problem. See what happens. See what happens. You know, um, again, we haven't done these. So this is a live stall, basically. Um, so for there to be no heads and um, four tails, there is a there are four choose zero ways to do that. I am choosing zero heads out of four um, four coins, right? So there's four choose zero ways for this to happen. Again, the total is always going to be two to the four. So if I want probability, I can just divide it by two to the four. Um, nothing really, nothing really matters. Um, one head, three tails. That's four to the one. Four choose one. Two heads, two tails. Four choose two. Um, again, the choose notation is just me saying, how many ways can I choose two things out of four objects? How many ways can I choose two coins that land heads out of four total coins? Um, and then three heads, four heads are going to be similar as well. So if we are to calculate the expected value of the difference, what's going to happen is that my zero heads and four tails are going to have a difference of four. So there's going to be... I feel like I just picked up a really rough problem. Um, oh no. Um, right, let, let's, let's do this first because I am desperately stalling for time. <laughs> um, okay, so my difference, this is, this is a zero head, uh, four tails case. There's four. So expected value is my value times the probability that's gonna happen summed up over all the possible values, expected value here. Um, so, um, to the person that is spamming um, IMO questions in chat, we are not doing them today. Um, times four choose zero um, ways that this can happen. Plus, so then if I have the one head three, so this is, uh, I'm getting confused. Zero head, four tails case. And there's a one head, three tails case. There's gonna be a difference of two. I'm gonna multiply that by the number of ways that can happen. Two has two two tails case. Yes, I just zero. want to jump in. Um, I think you're getting slightly trolled here because that's just kind of random walk, isn't it? Random walk, is it? Yeah, because like you can either go one direction. Or, wait, is it? Yeah, because because you can either like like you, you can think of it as like the absolute value. So so here, here's how you can here's how like the best way to think about it. So and you guys can see that I spoiled the question for, that I'm gonna do next. But um, the way you solve this question is, it's, it's, this is not a good question, by the way. So you have like, uh, you start at zero and you can either go to the right at probability one half or to the left. And what you want to do is you want to find uh, like your expected distance from zero because um, that is equivalent to the absolute value of a difference. And that turns out to be like log n or something, which is not like that, that requires higher math. It, it, it doesn't work. I I swear, like, ran a while, at least in 2D, I read somewhere that was square root in. Uh, oh, but that was like, yeah, probably square root, probably square root. No, but the issue is, um, it, it was, okay, so what happens as you have an infinite number, as you go up and up, it approaches root, and I'm pretty sure it's not actually, oh my god, I, I feel like I'm being trolled, but I don't. Yeah, this is not, this is like a higher math problem. I feel like with some yeah, binomial it's... manipulation, you could do this. Maybe, but like, um, let's not dwell on this, because I feel yeah, like. Yeah, we're, we're not going to keep doing we're, this. We're not going to do this. Um, <laughs> whoever is spamming like unsolved problems or like IMO problems, please don't. This is like, like we want to give the the people who have actually like good problems um, a chance to ask them. So, yeah, thank you, thank you for your understanding. Okay, but with that, let's get back to an actually good problem. So, um, solve the equation seven plus four equals eight, where all of the letters denote distinct digits. This is pretty cool. Okay, I actually really enjoy these problems. And the best part of this problem is that it actually says distinct digits right there. And that's a really big part of the problem. Because you see, because four has four digits, um, exactly, Hugo got it. See, S plus one is equal to E. So we already have that, S plus one equals E. And this is powerful because we have like three occurrences of the letter E. And so that is like pretty big. Um, okay, okay. So um, let's see, what, what can we do next now? Um, well, we could do something like, like we could have, I don't know, S, S is one, E is two, I don't know. We'll have one, two, V, E, one, two, V, two, N, which is already kind of pretty cool. Um, and then F, O, U, R, 
gives you 2i ght. Now you see the problem with this is now f has to be pretty big. Um, oh, I see someone asked how each can be distinct. It's because of the, the problem asked, as I said here, every every letter is distinct. So that's a kind of given. Um, so I think one thing that's cool also here is that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Wait, what? Wait, how many? Am I counting that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. We have 12 digits. Wait, Eric, wait, what? Wait, one, two, three, four. Wait, wait what's hold going on? on? We have, wait, I just realized. <laughs> Where are you right? S E V and then F O U R. I got trolled here. Okay, wow. Very fun. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so you gotta solve the problem I, with base 12 now. E H, yeah, okay, that was not that, that, that was that was a high quality troll. I'll, I'll give whoever gave that uh, a, a thumbs up, but but in general, let's not do this anymore. I'm gonna do we're gonna have a talk with the people who are selecting these problems for us because they're yeah. supposed to be the ones we're, that are these out. <laughs> Oh, that's also that um, oh, also of that previous question that I did was also a math control. Um, I searched this up just now, and it's way past the scope of what we're going to go go into. Yeah, here. but exactly. The answer is um, it does approach root, and so my uh, remembering from a random article I wrote was correct. Oh my god. <sighs> okay, guys, please give us good questions. Don't 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 make us like, I don't know. I mean, yeah. at a certain point, it isn't funny anymore. Okay, but we do have one that's supposedly for moms, which is stub plus toe equals ouch. Um, toe is equal to ouch. And they're all distinct as well, I believe. So um, and in this case, we actually have less than 10. So we're, we're good. Actually, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight okay that's good that's actually really nice because there's only 10 possible digits and there's eight of them that are taken up so we actually have a really like good condition here so yeah okay let's see again from before actually we have s plus one equals o which is a really useful condition as well and um let's see here t plus t is u but we can also have carry which is annoying um okay 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 what if we just start trying things? How about that? Okay, well, let's start just trying things. Um, so if we have S equals one, and then O is two, and then two is here as well. And now, um, I don't know, let's say that, well, there has to be carry over here. So like T has to be at least five as well. So if we have, I don't know, this is um, five and five, so that's zero, and then there's like a one up there and everything, right? And now at this point, um, wait, the rest of them can be anything. I think this is also stubby troll, but I can't tell. Um, four, six. Is this from Moms? It shouldn't be a troll. That's pretty respectful. Well, you know, the, the, the people here are diabolical, so. <laughs> true, true. That is very much true. <laughs> okay, so this does not work yet. Um, let me think here. Um, it could be six or seven, maybe. People here are just evil, you guys. This is not nice. I'm actually like very sad and annoyed partially. Okay, if it's like seven and seven, that'll be four. And then this one is also four, but then that means that this one cannot be. And we got ourselves in a bit of a pickle here, but I think we can get our way out of here as well. Um, Let's see here. We could have, wait, but use the same over all of them, right? So like that also has to be four. And then what that means is that, um, what is this? If we have like this one is, what? All right, so if we have like this one's five and that's nine. And then all we gotta do is for this one to not be carried, which does not seem to work. Wait, wait, hold on, but, but we can do better than this because actually now we have a lot of freedom. So um, we have like only one, two, four, and seven used. 
So you're going to have 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9 left. And at this point, um, hmm. Okay, so at this point, we have like, we, we, we can like fill in this one first with anything that works really. So we could have like, for example, three and five gives us eight. Oh, but this is a bit of a, this is a bit limiting actually. Oh my gosh. Um, I do want to point out that um, it was updated that the actual question was determine the greatest value of the four digit number, ouch. Oh my gosh. So that could probably help you a little bit. Yeah, that could help me a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm just messing thinking, with I this. was like, wait, 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 hold on. That doesn't work. Like, wait, hold on. Um, there's, there's too many degrees of freedom. So I was like very confused. Anyways, um, let's have this be eight and nine because it's obviously like the biggest now. Um, let's see. This is the carry. And so if we have this be like five and five and that's zero or something like that, I don't know. Um, and then over here, um, this one's also zero. Oh, but that doesn't work actually because the O and the C have to be distinct. So this is to be like six or something. Something like that. Okay. So like six and six, and that's two. Wait, but we can go even higher actually. We can go like seven and seven, and that gives us four. Okay, okay. So this is doable. Um now at this point the four is over here as well. And so, oh my gosh, this is a mess. Okay, one, two, three, five, and six are left. Those are the only ones that are left. And so we have to make equations with like this plus this equals this and that plus that equals that. Okay. Oh my gosh, what is this? You still have zero, right? Do you have zero? Or no, I don't. Oh yeah, I, do. I have zero as well. You're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, what if we have like like um one and then five? But then that doesn't work anymore, does it? I feel like your limiting thing is like you could have BEH carry, but the UOC just cannot carry, which is like U and O should probably be like small. Well, oh, wait, no, O is fixed because you have ouch and toe. You so you like have this. To... And then, no, wait, but hold on. What What if we make this carry? What if, what if we force this to carry? So that, like U is five instead. That make it bigger as well. So it would be like this. And at this point, um, what would that be? Hold on. Now we have now we we don't have, we we don't have five but we do have um four. You have an O in the second the tens digit. I just, you haven't written that down. I just wanted to put that out. Oh like, yeah, yeah. So all these five are distinct. Yeah, these five have to be distinct. Oh wait, hold on. Oh, there's an O there as well. Oh my gosh, you're right. Yeah, right, so there's right. four. So it's four. Okay, okay, okay. And you probably just got one, two, three at the end, right? No, yeah, one, two, three. yeah. Okay, boom, let's go. We got it. We solved an actual problem, guys. <laughs> yeah. We finally got an actual problem. Let's go. Uh, I knew it wasn't so bad. I knew it wasn't so bad. It was just not complete at first. So I was like very confused. Um, yeah, so I think uh, because we've been trolled from math problems too much today, I think we can, uh, me and Alan, just both answer a like general question someone has in the chat, and then we can continue on with some more math. So their question is, do you get nervous on math competitions? If so, how do you combat it? Um, I will go first. Um, first of all, yes, we absolutely do get nervous on math competitions. Um, it's it's a thing. Uh, I I remember just like, especially especially because you know you guys know like math counts countdown right? That them I mean taking a test at at home that that's okay right like especially with online you're in a comfortable environment you're in an environment that hopefully you're in almost all of the time that's better but like i remember going to like math counts countdown at state right um and you got like 200 people watching you it's terrifying um it's because especially because of the speed and so yes you do get you do get very very nervous but then you just start to enter enter the zone basically i the only way to describe it is the zone um, it's where you're, all you're focused on is just the math and the problems and the thinking behind it. And then you just lose anything that's happening around you. And therefore you don't actually get nervous. I find that I am way more nervous in the 30 minutes before my test than I am during the entirety of the test. Um, 
But to combat it, like com combat it before, um, I will say, make sure you're prepared. If you're prepared, you shouldn't be nervous, right? Right? You're prepared. Um, get a good night's sleep. Um, obviously, those obviously everyone tells you. Um, I like to just, just like walk. Make sure I'm physical. Make sure like I'm not just sitting there thinking about the impending doom that's about to happen. You know, just walk around a little bit. Um, if that's possible. Uh, yeah, that's all I've got for this one. Alan, do you have anything? Else? Yeah, actually, I have a lot about this. So um, I wanted to just say that, like, um, the first biggest thing is you really got to keep everything here in perspective. Like, the math competition might seem really important at the moment, and it might seem like it's, like, huge, and if you lose this, if you don't do well, like, your whole life will just collapse. And that's how it seemed like for me as well in, like, Math Counts Nationals and, like, everything like that. It seemed huge. It seemed like if I didn't do well in this, my whole life would just, like, end. And it still seems <laughs> like that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. it, like, like, seriously, you might be laughing at but like, 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 when it comes to it, when it comes to it, especially after, like, several rounds of qualification and, like, after you beat people from before, it just, it, like, all the stress is just huge. And so you got to remember, it doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter. Like, maybe it, it might help you a little bit with your like, confidence. You might meet some new people, but you will be fine no matter what happens. You will be fine. That is what you need to remember. Keep everything in perspective of like you. You are you are not defined by your test scores or by your performance. So just really keep that in mind, and that will really help um, with everything with with your stress with your um like nervousness with everything and yeah and about like the zone i i completely agree with that like the zone is really hard to get into but once you're into it it's just like you forget about everything and like everything is just math and you you, you get through everything but i think bigger than the zone bigger than doing well is just knowing that this this contest does not define you you are defined by yourself and so you are a human being and much more than just like a contest score. So yeah, that's why I right. said this. Yeah, I really like that as well. I really like uh, what Alon said there, right? Don't don't get too hung up on it. But a couple other things um, I just thought of. One, do practice tests, like, pra like actually practice, like not just the math counts competition, okay? That has a sprint route and a target route. Don't do the sprint route, then walk away, score it, uh, see how you did. Don't, don't do it, do the sprint round, Five minute break, target round. Okay, you need to at least at least once simulate what's going to happen at the comp competition because then um, your mind will just instinctively know you know what to do, right? It's you've seen this before, and you're you got to make your simulation as realistic as possible. The other thing is, the more you take these tests, the easier it gets, and the less nervous nervous you get. Like, because I've been doing math comp, we've all me and a lot have been doing competitions for a long time, right? And so. There's this thing in high school called AP tests, and they're big, pretty important competitions. Uh, not competitions, tests, just tests. Um, and people usually get really, really, really nervous about them, like my classmates. And then I just find that it's, you know, <clears throat> fine, because the more tests you do, the more you get used to that, you know, feeling of pressure, and then you can just deal with it, maybe subconsciously, maybe consciously, intentionally, you know. Uh, but I really yeah. like, oh, yeah. I just wanted to add on to that, that um, like the, the experience of math competitions is so much more than just math. It's not just like the math you learn there. It's also the skills you obtain from it. So like for, I'll, I'll give an example from my life. There was in, in my UW pre-cap class, there was a um, final there and it was like huge. It was, I think it was like, I don't remember, but it was like 50% of the grade, give or take. And so all of my classmates were like a wreck there. It was like, they were like nervous and it was, it was crazy for them. Me, I was just soaring right through, and I was like, "Yeah, it's it's cool." Because like some people say, you know, like, "Oh, they're just good taking tests. They they just know how to keep themselves like not nervous." But it's not a talent; it's a practice. Exactly, um, practice makes perfect. And taking tests is a skill like anything else. It's a skill you need to practice. And by doing math competitions, you will be so much more prepared for high school when you have to take AP tests, SATs, finals, everything like that where it's, it's just, it, you will like soar through them while everyone else is like stressed about them the, the night before and everything. So yeah, it's, it's about test taking. It's about like um, the, the ability to like commit to something and like 
trained for it. It's about like making friends and meeting people who are like enthusiastic about things. So yeah, it, it's right. about so much more than the math. And if you want to like, even want to like, I forgot what I was going to say. It's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I, I really like, I like really like your point there where, you know, high school is just full, full of tests and everything that you need to learn how to deal with that. And like also preparing for those things. You like, you have to learn how to learn um, literally, you know, um, by training for things. But I think we could get on with some more um, actual math um, after that quick break. So I am pretty sure that this problem is not a troll. They want us to find the uh, one over one factorial plus one over two factorial plus one over three factorial and one over four factorial and so on. And so here's the thing. I'm not actually going to be solving this. I'm just going to tell you the answer because I think it's really, really cool. And I think it's um, worthwhile um, to, sort of, to sort of understand. So if you don't know, factorial is like four times three times two times one. Um, that, that's what a factorial is like. Four factorial equals four times three times two times one. And um, essentially what this sums to, mathematicians, mathematicians, they don't bother expressing this uh, in terms of other numbers. They're just going to say, I'm just going to call this number E. That's right. This number is just literally called E. Um, it has some really, really, really cool uh, properties, um, this number, which I really want to show you, not because this, this problem here does it, it's kind of irrelevant, but E, let's say um, you are going, you, you open a bank account and there's interest, right? And the interest guy says, okay, well, I, I hate money and I like to give away money. So by the end of the year, um, there is a 100% interest rate. 100% interest rate. What that means is I put in a $1, I'm going to get $2 back by the end of the year. I get an extra entire dollar. Okay, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal, but you, 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 you know the guy's kind of gullible and you want to ask for more. So you ask him, well, could you separate this 100% into two 50% increments? So every six months, you're going to give me a 50% interest, and this is called compound interest. So what's going to happen is, let's say I put in $100, okay? I put in $100 on January, okay? July comes, it's six months later, you now have $150. Next year's January comes by, and he needs to add 50%, 50% to this. Well, it's compound interest, so based off this 150, he's going to add another 50%. So I'm going to have to get $225. That's an extra $25. Ah, but we're not done yet. Then you, you realize that and you think if you can push this to the limit. See what I did there. <laughs> uh, so you can say, okay, well, what if I give you, um, I see, I'm going to separate the year into 100 uh, equal sections. So 3.65 days. Every 3.65 days, you're going to add on to my money by 1%. Well, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to have my starting value of money. I'm going to call this X. And I'm going to multiply by 101% a hundred times. Or I could write this as one plus one over a hundred times a hundred. If I put in one dollar, for example, I don't even need this, this X over here. Um, there's a one over a zero. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, right. And it turns out, as you would probably guess, you make even more money. And you think to yourself, well, can I make, if I make as much money as possible, the, you can see the more segments I split this in, the more interest I'm getting because each compound interest is going to be compounded upon more and more. Well, what if I were to say, okay, I'm going to split my bank account into an infinite number of parts, my, my year into an infinite number of parts. So every instant you are giving me this infinitely small amount, and I know this is horrendous notation to everyone who's learned calculus, but bear with me. Um, how much, if I put in $1 under the system, how much do I get? E, that's how much I get. Uh, I think this is really, really cool. It's not infinite money. Um, e is the most you could possibly get uh, using, this, using this method. Essentially, um, what happens is the limit as 
in approaches infinity. So if I take this function and I just substitute in 1, 10, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, as n gets larger and larger and not larger, this number is going to approach e. We're not done yet with e. Say I have a graph of the function e to the x, OK? So this is my function. This is x axis. This is the y axis. This describes e to the x. All right. If I take a point and find the slope of this line using calculus, I'm not going to explain how we do that. If I find the slope of this tangent line here on this graph, its slope is going to be equal to e to the x. So wherever this x value might be, its slope is going to be equal to that. That's another property of <laughs> property of e. I'm going on a tangent right now, but um, yeah. And then e is used in um, all sorts of places everywhere. So I just wanted to like show how cool e is, really. Um, what are the properties on the of e? Alon, do you have any? Or um, I I think most of them are either troll. Or just like, um, I think already answered for some of them. I think people have already run out of um, problems to ask us. But there was one nice question earlier. Um, so I think someone asked, math is an art. How often do you guys train? Um, and this is actually a really good question. Um, so I'll share how much I train. I, I, I don't call it training, actually. I, I don't call it training. I call it learning. Because it doesn't feel like I'm training. It doesn't feel like I'm like running outside all day or like I'm doing the same repetitive thing over and over again. It feels like I'm growing. So I, I want to get that out of the way. It, it's fun. It's not like hard. It's, I mean, it is hard, but it's not like it's not like it's painful or anything. It's, it's fun. It's something I do because I love it and I just always want to do it. But I always have this great book. Some of you guys, you, some of you guys might know it. It's called Euclidean Geometry and Mathematical Olympiads. It's a great book. Always uh, next to me. And so whenever I feel like it, I just open it up and do some problems from there. So, yeah. And this is why this is probably my main success in math competitions, because I don't like do math competitions to prove anything to anyone. I don't do math competitions because someone forces me to. I do it because I love math and math competitions are just like the thing that comes from my love of math. So if I don't know if that completely answered your question, but that is how much I train, not necessarily how often I train. I will say that I have read that book that you held up three times, three times because the first, no, okay, the first time was from chapters one to four when I was like in like really early and I wasn't very good at math. Second time I read it, third time I just wanted to get more out of it, you know. Um, but yeah, I really agree with a lot here. Like it's not, it's not really training unless you count like you know practice tests, like the practice speed stuff. That's that's training and that's that's not the heart of math. Math is just really you know solving problems and learning concepts and techniques and all that stuff. And it's, I, I wouldn't call it training, I agree. Um, but yes, um, that book, really good, but it's crazy hard. It's like pretty hard. Um, it's really Talking to Eric and Alan here. I'm, I'm reconnecting everything. So the, the internet has come back. Cool, but very nice. I'll link everything up in a moment. Nice. Was he bridge when I said nice? It doesn't matter, okay. He's back. Oh, is he back? Can you guys is hear it us? back? Can you guys Hello. hear us? Chat really if you can hear us. Let's let's. I don't see anything. Uh, rip. Oh no. Ripperoni. Um. Oh, I see. I see. It's back. From. Oh, okay. It's back. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> okay. That's great. Okay. That's great. Well, let's pick up right back from where we left off with this awesome problem that someone put in the chat earlier. So Bob is a watermelon. The ratio of his weight on Earth to Mars is four to three. The ratio of his weight on a newly discovered planet, Boopsie Bob, to Jupiter is three to two. And the ratio of his weight on Jupiter to Mars is one to six. What is the ratio of Bob's weight on Earth to Boopsie Bob? Okay, so we have Earth, we have Mars, wait, Earth, Mars, Boopsie Bob, and Jupiter. Whoa, what? That's so cool. Okay, anyways. Um, the ratio of his weight on Earth to Mars is 4 to 3. So I'm going to put it here. I'm going to put a 4 and a 3 there. Perfect. It's Earth to Mars. Okay, now, the ratio of his weight on Boopsie Bob to Jupiter is 3 to 2. So we have a 3 to 2. And the ratio of his weight on Jupiter to Mars is 1 to 6. So that will be 1 and 6. Great. Um, okay. 
Interesting. Well, okay, what we want to do now is we want to find the ratio of his weight on Earth to Boopsie Bop. Okay, so let's just put all of these ratios underneath the same thing. So we have a 4 to 3 here and a 6 to 1 here. And so what we can do is we can multiply this ratio by 2, so it would be 8 to 6, and put the 8 over here. Because now we have 8 to 6, which is recording 4 to 3, stopped. and 6 to 1. So, yeah. Um, recording stopped is not a good sign, is it? Oh, can you guys hear us? Can you guys put a um, message to shout your life if you guys can hear us? Because we heard recording stop, and I think that meant... Okay, it works. I think it works. Okay, Okay. Good. that's great. That's good. Okay, we, yeah, we, we were confused. Okay, that's great. Great to hear. So, we have... Awesome, I love this. Okay, so we have 3 and 2 here from Boopsie Bop to Jupiter, and we want to also integrate that, right? Because we, we, we have this big gaping hole right there. And to do that, we want to make this 1 become 2. So, we're going to multiply this whole ratio by 2, and that then becomes 16... 12 and 2 and whoa we'll look 2 and 2 so we can put the 3 on here as well and now we have our full ratio 16 to 12 to 3 to 2 and we can now extract the ratio of earth to boopsie bop which is 16 to 3 which is our answer perfect um, very nice we got, actually got through a question um we have a Another just general question. Um, how would you recommend learning new math concepts for the first time and how to remember and or understand previous concepts? Um, so for the latter question, um, I have one thing to say, use it. The more you use it, the more you are going to remember it and the more um, familiar you're gonna be with it. So, you know, you're gonna become better at using it to understand previous concepts. And that's what I love about math because it keeps building on top of itself. You know, everything's connected. So when you learn new things, you're gonna be just refreshing old ones naturally. I've had classmates who ask me like, Eric, how do you, how do you remember all of these, all these trig formulas? I'm like, I, I use them every day. You know, you kind of have to try to forget them, you know, um, and then learning new math concepts for the first time um that's just you have to be slow deliberate and you have to connect it to things you've already learned before you have to think well what could i use this for um when when will i use this what are the strengths weaknesses um and practice problems so the more practice problems you could do like a lot of books when books i always look for books that have practice problem and solutions so i i can practice the things that i've just learned um in textbooks um most of them are written that way i like it um and then yeah, that's all I've got um, a lot. Yeah, and actually to add on to that, I think um, not, like it's really important to like, um, I guess, like practice your concepts over and over again, but it's also really important to understand them. Because in my case, for instance, um, so like for the trig identities, for example, like you have, I don't know, um, sine of two theta is equal to two sine theta cosine theta. I don't memorize this. I actually have a system to derive these trig identities which is more advanced, so I won't go over it here. But essentially, I understand why they're true and not like I, I don't just memorize them, if that makes sense. So it's really big to like understand them because in my case, I actually derive a lot of my um, theorems and formulas on test. And so I have a system for understanding why they're true um, and deriving them because it's easy to remember why something is true and like how to get to it rather than like the actual fact itself. And it's also more reliable as well. Because you know, if you misplace a symbol or something in the formula, you can't do anything about it. But if you if you like remembered uh, method incorrectly, you can just sort of patch it with, with your like logic and reasoning. So yeah, right. I really really like that point because like a lot of formulas are going to be complicated. You're going to forget things. You're going to mess up the sign of something. Is it positive or negative? Is there a factor of two here or not? Um, so I really like uh, how Alan pointed out that we. You, I I also like to derive things. Um, maybe not sine 2 theta equals 2 sine theta, cosine theta, um, but, you know, a lot of other trig formulas, like sum to product or that sort of stuff, that's, because there's only so much memory, raw memory that we have, you know, um, well, yeah, understanding, but speed is important, um, then you, yes, you have to just memorize, that's, you, there's no way around it, but speed is important, I'm going to be completely honest with you, at these higher level contests, um, the USA JMO um, has six questions and they give you nine hours. I think you have time to derive some formulas. Uh, but like for math counts and stuff, um, 
especially countdown formulas, they're not going to go super in depth. So you can just memorize some of the more basic ones. And then, especially, I assume you're talking about countdown or the sprint round. Um, countdown, especially, just get good at speed reading. Okay, that's step one. Get good at speed reading. And then computation, computation, uh, lots of computation tricks. Uh, memorize special properties of numbers, square numbers, powers of two, prime numbers. They're going to help you a lot more than you're going to think. Um, it's a lot of little stuff in general. And it's like, you, you don't, I, I don't want to like, I, I don't think you should specifically train for this. I, I don't think you should like specifically go into problems with the intent of memorizing square numbers and prime factors and different squares and all these little, little tricks that save you, they shave you half a second each time you use them. You just practice doing fast math and then you're just gonna naturally get better. Um, okay, elaborate on the system you spoke of. Oh, oh my okay, best. So I can do I that, can. but this requires like somewhat high level math. So um, if you would like, um, the way I remember it is using the formula e to the power of i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. And this is an incredibly useful formula in general, um, and it's pretty easy to remember as well. So yeah, and then what you do here is you would just um, like evaluate e to the i theta squared which is just e to the i two theta. So you would evaluate this by just squaring this, and that will allow you to match up coefficients to figure out what um, this is, if that makes sense. So yeah. And yeah, right. that is in fact another application of e. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so you might be saying, well, what's i is, um, uh, also if you don't know, i is the square root of negative one which is probably making a lot of you um, go really we're like, why can you take us something to the power of x square and negative one? Um, it actually goes back to this uh, one over, to this actually, it actually connects back to this um, in a really weird way, but that requires advanced calculus and we're not gonna go over that. So um, I feel like- It is now um, 4 p.m. in the best time zone, by the way. Ah, uh, yes, of course. We only measure in Pacific time here. Yeah, yeah. So with that, um, we ran out of time for everything. Really sorry for people who like just got here and are um, wondering about some of their own questions. But I believe there is. Oh wow, that is a huge question. But um, I believe there is another time zone. Oh, another um, ask Matt anything on Tuesday. On Tuesday. So if you have more questions, make sure to come to that one. Um, but yeah. So anything else, Eric? Um, I think we just just answer super super eye on this question just real quick. Um, recently started learning by nature matrices determine whether we put our vectors in columns or rows. I've seen them in columns up until now. Was there a reason that is preferred to rows? Um, the term. So are you talking about like vector multiplication or is this just another one of those agreed upon I think this things? is way out of the scope of our lessons. So let, let's not do this preferably. Yeah, I, I, I want to say it's just one of those agreed upon things or just maybe to make it easier to read because rows are just way wider than columns, you know? I, I think that's what's going on to answer your question. Um, we really went on like 10 tangents today <laughs> and got trolled like three times. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, guys, for next Ask Not Anything, please, let's not do this. Like, it's it's funny for like a couple times, but it's just not very funny afterwards. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot of people who do want their um, questions to be answered. And we won't be able but to get to that strictly because... strictly for middle schoolers. So, um, any high school on um, math... Get out of here. You can apply to be behind the seat, in the seat behind the Zoom. You don't get to be the one giving out questions, okay? Get out of here. <laughs> I, I realized this was a mistake when I shared the link to my server with uh, to a Discord server with a bunch of high schoolers and telling them to share them to the middle schoolers. I didn't think that a high schooler just joined and start spamming IMO questions. I'm not sure if it was them or someone else, but if you're from OGA, I'm looking at you. Um... <laughs> Okay. Yeah, but with that, I think we have to wrap it up now. Um, so yeah, goodbye, everyone. Bye, and I think Professor Lo has a couple things to say after that, I think, or something. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs>